In the first days of May 2024, the territory occupied by the state of Rio Grande do Sul was hit by the biggest climate catastrophe in its history. Over a week of intense rainfall caused several rivers to overflow, sweeping away dozens of towns and destroying everything in their path. and then flowing into the Guaybá River, causing the biggest flood ever recorded in the greater Porto Alegre region and other cities in the state. Hundreds of people died. Thousands lost everything. Hundreds of thousands were left homeless. More than a million were affected. Entire towns were practically wiped out. Chaos and destruction. As well as having a direct responsibility for the devastation of the planet, producing more and more catastrophes. At the heart of the horror, we see the complete inability of the state and capitalism to take care of our lives. On the other hand, the state at all levels has made it clear that its priority is not and never has been to protect our lives. For decades, the Brazilian state has ignored the warnings about the dangers of environmental destruction and climate change and has failed to take effective measures to prevent catastrophes like this one. But more than that, it has been an active agent of destruction, sometimes devastating at a slower pace, sometimes ravaging the land more viciously. Under Bolsonaro's neo-fascist government, this contempt for life and hatred of nature was on full display. But even social democratic regimes, including the governments of the Workers' Party, have contributed heavily to global warming promoting the automotive industry, oil extraction, and other sources of energy with a high environmental impact to boost economic growth. At state and municipal level, the state's negligence is repeated with an even more direct and immediate impact on our lives. Despite repeated warnings from meteorological systems, the state has failed to draw up adequate evacuation plans and warnings. On the contrary, it has not invested the minimum required in preventing and protecting the population. The current governor, Eduardo Leite, from the right-wing party PSDB, has weakened the state's environmental legislation to favor business and reduce the budget for civil defense during his government. De alguma forma alertam, mas o governo também vive outras né, pautas e agendas. And the floodgates that protect Porto Alegre have failed due to lack of maintenance and errors in their closure. What happened was worsened by the fact that the municipal water and sewage department had accumulated the demands of the rainwater sewage department. The body responsible for the system of dikes, floodgates, and pumping stations that protect the Rio Grande do Sul capital from flooding and not received enough resources in the last administrations of Porto Alegre City Hall. According to experts, the city would not have flooded if the system had been properly maintained and managed. It gets worse. The mayor of Porto Alegre, Sebastião Melo, only decreed water rationing after 85% of the city already had no access to drinking water. And the population of some neighborhoods was only informed of the disconnection of the pumps that prevented flooding of their homes after they had been turned off, giving them no time to evacuate. The city government also got in the way of volunteers who had organized donation centers in seated spaces and kept them running for weeks, 
by making agreements with the property owners so that they would take over the operations that until then had been self-organized by volunteers who were then excluded and criminalized. Isso aqui tá acontecendo, não era pra eu estar me preocupando com isso agora, era pra eu estar carregando caminhão entregando pras pessoas. In fact, in the vast majority of neighborhoods, aid to those affected by the flood was provided by communities themselves and by volunteer supporters who worked together to guarantee supplies of water, food, clothes, and blankets. One example was the Quilombo dos Machado in the Sarandi district of Porto Alegre, which with the support of other urban Quilombos in the city, organized these operations for weeks without any support from the state. Esse acolhimento que o Estado deveria fazer, na verdade, a comunidade mesmo, a gente com a gente e pela gente, está fazendo. When they asked Governor Eduardo Leite for help, he replied, O poder público não tem a estrutura suficiente para atender em todas as pontas. In addition, he left incarcerated people stranded in prisons in the region without access to water, food or hygiene items. It was up to inmates' families, also affected by the floods, to organize themselves to bring these basic items to avoid even greater suffering by those kidnapped by the state. It's always good to remember that this is not a case of inaction or failure on the part of the state. These situations are part of the ongoing extermination project. Not only is capitalism at the root of climate change that threatens all life on Earth, but the actions of corporations and big capitalists have done little to help with rescues and alleviate the suffering of the population. On the contrary, they have made the situation even worse. Capitalists failed to keep the supermarkets that were still operating stocked, because since they were interested in profit, they allowed richer people to stock up on water and groceries. At the same time, Dozens of stores were flooded with their entire stock of water, food and other essential items for the population locked inside under the protection of police and security guards armed with rifles. Companies and the state were more interested in protecting this merchandise than letting people have access to the items they needed most. Even if those items were later to be disposed of or compensated by the insurance company. While volunteers rescued tens of thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from rooftops, setting up and organizing spaces to shelter them with veterinary care and food, pet stores abandoned fish, birds, and mammals in their cages inside the flooded stores, even though there was plenty of time to transfer them to safe spaces. Animals sold as objects and abandoned to drown, highlighting the logic of the system. For capitalists, life is just another commodity that'll be covered by insurance. The little support that the big companies offered was derisory. Grandine, one of the largest shoe producers in the world, suggested that its workers donate items from the food packages they receive monthly to those affected by the floods. Ambev, the world's largest brewery, whose annual profits are twice the size of the city of Porto Alegre's budget, has put drinking water into aluminum cans in what constituted more a marketing stunt than any form of real solidarity. FIERGS, the organization that represents the industries of Rio Grande do Sul, has requested 100 billion reals in aid from the federal government for the recovery of companies hit by the floods making it clear that when capitalists talk about a minimal stake, it's only when it comes to the interests of the less well-off. But they want a strong state to support and defend the interests of the rich. Defenders of capitalism praised the actions of billionaires and businessmen who donated small fractions of their fortunes to help the flood victims. That's when the good deeds were in complete lies like the image showing billionaire Luciano Hang's helicopter rescuing stranded people, which was actually an image generated by artificial intelligence. 
Meanwhile, ordinary people, including some who have lost everything, have shown much more solidarity and willingness to help, donating proportionally much more of their resources than the super rich. A Solidarity livestream gig by a rock band raised more money than the donations from the US government and the egocentric billionaire Elon Musk combined. Not to mention that capitalists profited directly from the catastrophe. Like the supermarkets that sold all their stocks of bottled water to desperate people, often at abusive prices, and had record sales with the generosity of ordinary people who bought items to donate to those who lost everything. And they will continue to profit as long as the people affected and those solidarizing with them are struggling to rebuild what has been lost. The municipal and state governments intend to build temporary cities for the tens of thousands of displaced people until the neighborhoods where they lived are rebuilt, if possible, or it is decided where they will live. But these temporary buildings are totally unnecessary. Porto Alegre alone has more than 100,000 empty homes. In the city center, 30% of homes are vacant. This is 10 times more than the number of temporary homes planned in the city. This plan is nothing more than another way of generating profit for developers and for politicians to boost their popularity through populist and ineffective measures that don't tackle the root of suffering and inequality. Worse than that, it is an attempt to displace the poor and black population away from areas coveted by the state and developers. Paving the way for the appropriation of their former homes by predatory construction companies. For politicians and capitalists, reconstruction is an opportunity. Huge quantities of building materials will be needed to rebuild the infrastructure and homes destroyed by the water. And capitalists will profit from producing and selling these materials. Companies will be hired through hastily put together tenders. And, as with any action by the state allied to capitalism, there will be delays, corruption, overbilling, embezzlement, and favoritism. Let's not kid ourselves, because not even supposedly left-wing governments such as the PT's federal government have the courage and power to attack capitalism and its mob of reactionary defenders head-on. No matter which party was or will be in government, from the PT's democratic center-left to Bolsonaro's lunatic far-right, the Brazilian state is intrinsically connected to capitalism to the enrichment of an elite, bargaining away the future of life on the planet in exchange for governability. The tragedy that devastated the territory occupied by the state of Rio Grande do Sul was not simply an unavoidable natural disaster. It is yet another in a series of extreme climatic events happening with increasing frequency and intensity. And they are the result of decades of destruction and exploitation of the planet, ignoring warning from scientists and repressing the resistance of social movements and indigenous peoples in the name of economic growth. A brutal system where state and capitalism come together to plunder the earth and exploit our bodies. We feel the consequences of a global problem. The same capitalism that causes floods in Rio Grande do Sul causes droughts in the Pantanal wetlands and in the Amazon rainforest, commits genocide in Gaza to control natural gas reserves and oppresses students who rise up against this massacre, contaminates water, 
violates indigenous territories and sinks entire neighborhoods to extract coveted materials, destroys forests, oceans, mountains, and deserts to secure profit for a handful of privileged people, while condemning billions to suffering and precariousness. If, on the one hand, state and capitalism have once again shown that their priority is not the well-being of the population or life in general, on the other hand, we have seen that solidarity springs up spontaneously and we are able to support each other, even overcoming serious ideological differences. Thousands of people took the lead and organized rescues using their own resources, risking their own lives to save those of other people, human or not. The creation of shelters and support points such as donation distribution centers and solidarity and emergency kitchens, which produce thousands of meals a day for the displays transported by volunteer drivers all maintained by a massive network of solidarity, which extended beyond the regions affected by the disaster, spreading throughout the territory occupied by the Brazilian state and other countries. When disaster struck, the meritocracy and individualism of capitalism were quickly cast aside by the majority of the population, who dedicated their time to helping the other people without asking themselves if they deserved it and without expecting any reward for it who used their own money to ensure that other people had something to wear and something to eat, who shared their material resources without demanding a financial exchange, who put their lives at risk to ensure the survival of another. In the midst of the catastrophe, people had the chance to realize that we are all in this together, that money is of little help when there is no more water to sell on the market, the state and capital will do everything in their power to take over and centralize the actions of self-organized solidarity, whether it's forcibly taking control of operations, requisitioning the buildings used to resume classes or work, coercing people to return to their jobs, or formalizing and institutionalizing the organizations that remain. Our self-organization and unrestricted solidarity are a real threat to the state and capital because they depend on our disunity, our indifference and inaction in the face of other people's suffering. To prevent capitalism from using this and future catastrophes to advance its destructive projects, we need to continue mobilizing and coordinating. It's up to us to organize ourselves to seize and occupy idled and abandoned buildings and to ensure that they are used for the benefit of our communities. Make sure that church buildings are used to support people in need and not to spread hatred and intolerance. Fight to ensure that no one profits from the tragedy so that resources are distributed to those in need. If we need to rebuild our lives and our cities, let's make sure we build something better, more just. If what we call humanity has a future, it will be collective or it won't be at all.